Edible scene on Wednesday at the Supreme Court. More than 100 of her former law clerks, people who had worked closely with her in chambers over her 27 years on the court, were there as honorary pallbearers greeting her casket. She lay in repose at the court for two days. Thousands came out to honor her. And this morning, the tributes move across the street directly to the U.S. Capitol, where Justice Ginsburg will become the first woman ever to lie in state. NBC's Capitol Hill correspondent Casey Hunt is is with us this morning as are our other correspondents. And we see, Casey, the hearse has arrived. And in a moment, we expect it to be carried up the steps into the Capitol where a ceremony will begin. That's right, Savannah. And this ceremony will represent the first time ever that a woman has lain in state here at the United States Capitol. Ruth Bader Ginsburg will also be the first Jewish person to ever lie in state here. And as you can see, this is Statuary Hall. This is on the side of the House of Representatives, overseen, of course, by Democratic Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who herself, the first ever woman Speaker of the House and currently the most powerful woman in Washington. And that theme is going to be reflected through today, underscoring just how much RBG meant to the women here in Congress in terms of blazing trails that they were able to follow to, to ultimately be elected and become members of Congress, and also to women and girls across the country for whom she was an, an iconic uh, figure and somebody who has been mourned uh, across the country. So one thing that we're following today, Savannah, is in ceremonies like this, traditionally the leadership of, of the Congress, usually the bipartisan leadership of the Congress, and in this case, of course, that's House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, uh, the minority leader Kevin McCarthy, as well uh, as the majority leader Mitch McConnell and the minority leader Chuck Schumer on the Senate side. We do not today expect to see Mitch McConnell or Kevin McCarthy, the Republican leaders. I'm told uh, by a source with, familiar with the matter that Mitch McConnell is on the list of regrets uh, that was uh, extended, uh, of the invitations that were extended to members for this private ceremony that's going to take place in Statuary Hall. So uh, that seems to be something of a sign of, of our divided times. I asked Mitch McConnell's office why uh, he he would not be in attendance today. Uh, they have said that they don't have any updates on his schedule. He, of course, has been going home to Kentucky most weekends to campaign for his Senate seat. So we'll keep you updated if we learn anything more along those lines. But this, of course, reflects just how divisive this process already has become to fill Ruth Bader Ginsburg's seat, Savannah. Well, we are uh, about to witness that moment. It was so moving the other day at the court when her law clerks were gathered there. This is the moment that her casket will now be carried into the east side of the Capitol to lie in state, as Casey mentioned, uh, an honor never before received by any woman at the U.S. Capitol. Rosa Parks, a civil rights icon, did lie in honor, which is what is reserved for civilians. But we have not seen a woman lie in state, and this honor, of course, marks yet another first for Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Let's watch.
As we watch this scene unfold, we want to turn to NBC's longtime Supreme Court correspondent, Justice correspondent, Pete Williams, who, of course, was there on Wednesday when we saw a similar scene unfold at the court, who has spent many, many years listening to the arguments at the court and watching Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It was such an outpouring, Pete. And uh, the, the remarks made about Ruth Bader Ginsburg from the Chief Justice John Roberts uh, were particularly warm the other day. It was. I, you know, Chief Justice Roberts did not like to see, as any chief wouldn't, see members of the court trying to basically steal the limelight outside the court. But he, he really was, I think, delighted, amused a little bit, and delighted by her notoriety as a cultural icon. And there was a great warmth in his remarks. The line to see her, to walk past the casket, uh, was continuous on Wednesday, and of course she uh, lay in repose at the court yesterday, uh, and the, the line was supposed to shut off at 10 o'clock last night, and I think they finally closed it down at 11 last night, uh, and I'm sure it would have continued. I know when I got to the court yesterday morning before dawn, uh, there were still people, there were already people in line waiting to see it. Now the difference today, of course, is that this ceremony will be entirely indoors, uh, there'll be no chance for the public to walk past um, uh, the casket in front of the Capitol. And, you know, it's fitting that that was done at the Supreme Court, which on which she served for so many years. Um, it's also, I think, fitting, as Casey noted, that uh, this woman who did so much to advance the cause of women's rights, uh, this is really an all-woman ceremony today. Uh, introductory remarks from the House Speaker, Nancy Pelosi. We'll hear again from Lauren Holtzblatt the rabbi who was uh, so eloquent at the ceremony on Wednesday. And we'll also hear from Denise Graves, the mezzo-soprano, the international opera star, who was a great friend of Justice Ginsburg's. And it really brings together the three loves of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's life, her family, the law, <sighs> excuse me, and opera. Kind of a tough day here. Well, Pete, take a breath. Uh, so many people feel a uh, connection to Ruth Bader Ginsburg over the years as, as she has become, uh, you know, a, an icon in many ways and a cultural figure. Andrea Mitchell was uh, one who covered her over the years, but also who be developed a personal friendship. And Andrea, I mean, we really see that this is a very fitting tribute, as Pete mentioned, to a woman who spent so much time working on behalf of equality for women across this country. I believe that today uh, the House Speaker has given preferential treatment to the female members of Congress who will get to pay their respects first. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong about that, but um, it's, it's very much a, a fitting tribute to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That is correct. and. Um I can relate to Pete's emotion at this, watching the flag waving over the Capitol at half-staff and the flag-draped casket being brought in. Um, the fact that she is the first woman, the first Jewish person, that she was such a mentor to so many. We've seen the pictures of the little girls dressed in black robes with little lace collars and big fake eyeglasses. We've just seen so much that as we wait for the doors to open to Statuary Hall and see Speaker Pelosi and the women beginning to parade in, and other women members and other members will be able to come later after the ceremony and um, after the official ceremony before her official departure around 12.30, 12.45. But as you've noted, this will be an all-woman uh, event. Denise Graves, a particular favorite, as you know, her passion for opera. As the Chief Justice said the other day about opera, she was passionate about sports, clueless, um, showing the humor that she would have appreciated in listening and reading what people have said about her, people so close to her, uh, the other justices, as well as her former clerks. It's so clear, Savannah, that she had an, an enormous following among women. And as much as she was a leader in many aspects of, of the law, 
voter rights and gender rights for men as well as women, affirmative action, rights for in the military, um, LGBTQ rights, but what she means to women of, of all types and even, you know, Republican women and women who might not follow her ideologically. She just opened up so many doors for all of us. And I know I would not have had my job if not for the work she did before she entered the court in the 70s, arguing those five cases successfully before the all-male Supreme Court. And there you see Statuary Hall, Savannah, with people distanced and masked. And as you know, the Bidens are going to be there today. Yes. One of their rare visits to Washington, they were here, of course, for John Lewis. We saw a, a shot of Jill Biden and Joe Biden a few moments ago. I want to bring in Professor Neil Katyal, who is the former acting Solicitor General of the United States, whose job then called for him to argue cases on behalf of the United States before the Supreme Court, and whose job now has him litigating before the Supreme Court. And Neil, you have appeared before Justice Ginsburg and her fellow justices many, many times. What was it like when you knew you had to convince Ruth Bader Ginsburg? It was always a challenge for, you know, she always came in loaded for bear. She'd always ask the first question, almost always at argument. She's an extraordinary woman. And on Wednesday, Savannah, you and I were talking about how fitting it was to see her uh, image uh, coming up, the, her, her casket coming up the Supreme Court steps when the inscription on the court is equal justice under law and how fitting it was. And her lying in state today is also fitting. I mean, we she's had so many firsts. First woman of the Harvard Law Review as a student, first woman tenured law professor at Columbia, first woman to win that the Equal Protection Clause requires heightened scrutiny on discrimination. And now she's continuing her first, for, even in death, the first woman to lie in state, the first person of Jewish descent to lie in state. Um, and the second person to lie in state was Abraham Lincoln. And he was a tall man from Illinois. She's a tiny woman from New York. But she continues in his tradition, and there is no American in our lifetimes who deserves that honor of lying where Abraham Lincoln once did than her. And what a different world she helped to make. Uh, her mother was a bookkeeper in Brooklyn, and, and Justice Ginsburg was sometimes asked, what's the difference between a bookkeeper in Brooklyn and a Supreme Court Justice of the United States? And she would say, one generation. And when she graduated from law school at the top of her class, Columbia Law, Andrea, she couldn't even find a job. Such was the, the situation there at the time. Pete, I'll, I'll send that one to you. No, but what you said was so beautiful. Yeah, so, so, many, so many changes here. And um, I think we also have to note that this tradition of lying in state really began in 1852. And not many Americans have received this honor. This is the statuary hall. This is the old house chamber. The, the, the current place where the house meets is just beyond this. Uh, and this is where the house used to meet. So a great deal of history here. She's the second Supreme Court justice to receive this honor. The first was uh, William Howard Taft, who lay in state in the Capitol about a month after he stepped down from the Supreme Court because of health reasons. But of course, he had also been president of the United States. So she's the first person to receive this honor strictly for her service on the Supreme Court. And we watch as uh, the minority leader, Democrat leader from the Senate, Chuck Schumer, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who presides over this ceremony today and has organized many of the details that, as we've been mentioning this morning, are really a tribute to women and the work that Ruth Bader Ginsburg did on behalf of women. And Neil, as you think about her legacy and you think about how the court may change, are there aspects of the work of Ruth Bader Ginsburg that will stand the test of time? What impact does she have on the law? Oh, I think absolutely. Um, she may not always have five votes, as she didn't in her lifetime, but I do think in 200 years, she's one of the few Americans alive today that uh, people 200 years ago will know by name. She stood for something profound. And, you know, actually outside Statutory Hall, where her casket now is, there's this quote from FDR that's emblazoned there, which is, we must remember that any oppression, any injustice, any hatred is a wedge designed to attack our civilization. That's what's right outside Statutory Hall. And that's what her life's work was about. 
Um, she will be remembered for generation after generation as a giant in the law, someone who had the imagination to understand that law is a profoundly human endeavor that can make the country better. And in her, you know, incremental, careful, plotting, and yet brilliant way, her life's work made that a reality. Let's pause and watch this scene unfold. Center base. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the United States House of Representatives. It is with profound sorrow and deep sympathy to the Ginsburg family that I have the high honor to welcome Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg to lie in state in the capital of the United States. She does so on a catafalque built for Abraham Lincoln. May she rest in peace.
Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Denise Graves, accompanied by Miss Laura Ward. Ladies and gentlemen, Rabbi Lauren Holtzblatt. Madam Speaker, Vice President Biden, Senator Harris, and to all of our leaders who are gathered today, thank you. Psalms 118, verse 5. Min hametzar karatia anani vamecham 
מן המצר קראתי ענני במחוויה תדעי איי תדעי איי תדעי איי ידעי נדעי נדעי From the narrow streets I call out to you You, God, answered me with expanse. In the chambers of Justice Ginsburg hangs a framed piece of art that reads, Tzedek, Tzedek, Tirdof. Justice, justice, you must pursue. A command in the 16th chapter of Deuteronomy. The rabbinic tradition assigns meaning to every single word in the Torah. So there must be a reason why tzedek, justice, is written twice. The repetition here teaches Ibn Ezra, a medieval rabbi, that time and time again, all of the days of your life, you must pursue justice. This was how Justice Ginsburg lived her life. Justice did not arrive like a lightning bolt, but rather through dogged persistence. All the days of her life, real change, she said, enduring change, happens one step at a time. She faced many obstacles in her life, even from a young age. Though chosen as the valedictorian of her high school class, she gave no graduation speech. Instead, she grieved at home with her father after burying her beloved mother one day before graduation. Her family had already suffered terrible loss with the death of her sister when Justice Ginsburg was only 14 months old. But Justice Ginsburg kept rising. A full scholarship to Cornell University and only one of nine women in her Harvard Law School class. After transferring to Columbia Law School, she graduated first in her class, yet she could not find a job. No firm in New York would hire her because she was a woman. These obstacles didn't deter her. She pressed on. As she said in an interview with her dear friend, Nina Totenberg, and I quote, I get out of law school with top grades. No law firm in the city of New York will hire me. I end up teaching. That gave me time to devote to the movement of evening out the rights, <clears throat> excuse me, of women and men. I was nominated to a vacancy on the D.C. Circuit. Justice O'Connor once said to me, suppose we had come of age in a time when women lawyers were welcome at the bar. You know what? Today we would have been retired partners from some large law firm. But because the route was not open to us, we had to find another way and both end up on the United States Supreme Court. All the days of her life, she pursued justice, even in illness. She fought five bouts with cancer, and she supported her beloved Marty through his battle with cancer as well. Each time, she pressed forward. She returned to work, to the bench, to the court, with focus each and every time. Tzedek, Tzedek, Tirdof. Nothing was given. Pursuing justice took resilience, 
persistence, a commitment to never stop. As a lawyer, she won equality for women and men, not in one swift victory, but brick by brick, case by case, through meticulous, careful lawyering. She changed the course of American law. And even when her views did not prevail, she still fought. In recent years, Justice Ginsburg became famous for her dissents. Despair was not an option. She said, and I quote, dissents speak to a future age. It's not simply to say, my colleagues are wrong and I would do it this way. But the greatest dissents do become court opinions and gradually, over time, their views become the dominant view. So that the dissenters hope that they are writing not for today, but for tomorrow. Justice Ginsburg's dissents were not cries of defeat. They were blueprint, blueprints for the future. Justice Ginsburg loved her family, her grandchildren, her dear friends, her colleagues, and her court family. We all send our love to you. And Justice Ginsburg also loved the court to which she so devoted her life. A court for all of us. It was Justice Ginsburg's tenacious hope to preserve the integrity of the court. Today, she makes history again as the first woman and the first Jewish woman to lie in state. Today, we stand in sorrow, and tomorrow, we, the people, must carry on Justice Ginsburg's legacy. Even as our hearts are breaking, we must rise with her strength and move forward. She was our prophet, our North Star, our strength for so very long. Now she must be permitted to rest after toiling so hard for every single one of us. May the memory of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Yita Rucho Batsiro Lea, forever and ever be a blessing. Zichrona Levracha. God, give us the strength and bless us with the courage, the intelligence, the bravery, and the unbreakable resolve to pursue justice. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Denise Graves, accompanied by Miss Laura Ward.
to share. the sergeants at arms staff. And that completes the brief ceremony as Ruth Bader Ginsburg is brought to lie in state at the United States Capitol, a ceremony that was brief with lots of touches that the justice surely would have appreciated, including an opera singer. She loved opera, singing a song with the refrain at the end, America, I gave my best to you. And it's an all-female presentation we saw today. We will see that female members of Congress will have the first opportunity after the family to pay their respects to the casket. And as have, we have remarked, but bears repeating, she is the first woman ever to lie in state at the U.S. Capitol. And the second Supreme Court justice ever, although William Howard Taft had also been president, so we could say she's the first Supreme Court justice who, to lie in state in her own right. And as we watch this procession begin, let's bring in Erin Carmone, who was the co-author of the book Notorious RBG, uh, a moniker that definitely stuck, and Erin, one that she came to embrace. Uh, that's right, Savannah. You know, looking at these images from the Capitol, I'm struck by how Justice Ginsburg said that women belong everywhere decisions are being made. She would say it shouldn't be that women are the exception. One of the reasons that she embraced the nickname of Notorious RBG and she embraced the adoration of people all over the world, but especially young women, is because she wanted to be a role model. She wanted to model what it meant to be one of the very few at first, but hopefully not to be the last, and to open doors for the women that came after her. She was very uh, aware of her generational legacy, both her debt to women who came before and wanting to really make sure that what came after was not only one woman in the room being forced to represent for all women. And, you know, I was very struck by the fact that it wasn't just an opera singer today. It was Denise Graves, who, is, who was a personal friend of Justice Ginsburg's. Um, they often spent time together. And Justice Ginsburg, although she was not a very effusive person, she would actually cry during the opera. And she and Denise Graves gave a joint interview in which they talked about the fact that although they both loved opera, it often had, uh, systemic racism had often meant that black singers weren't given a chance. So it's, it's very moving and very significant that this friend of Justice Ginsburg sang so beautifully at her ceremony. And Lauren Holtzblatt, the rabbi who spoke not just today but on Wednesday, also has a personal connection. She's married to one of Justice Ginsburg's former law clerks and has clearly spent a lot of time with Justice Ginsburg and spoke so movingly of her life and the obstacles that she encountered as a young woman, obstacles that she then worked to make sure no other woman would have to face again. I want to turn to, to Neil Katyal. It, it, it strikes me as we thought about opera and how much she loved it. She had a friend on the court who loved opera as well, and uh, some thought they were um, strange bedfellows. 
Justice Antonin Scalia, who had to be one of the court's most ardent conservatives, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and yet they had this friendship and warmth between them that seemed to stop at the court when they were writing zingers, as Ruth Bader Ginsburg would say, in terms of opinions. They didn't hold back. Exactly. I mean, you know, these are two people who came at the law from pretty much diametrically opposed positions, but they shared in their love of the law, and um, uh, and they became best friends, spending every New Year's Eve together for 30 years with their families. And um, uh, and the friendship didn't stop at the door of the Supreme Court. It continued behind the closed doors, but they certainly gave it to each other in their written opinions and in their oral dissents. I mean, they fought like cats and dogs. Um, but, you know, I think particularly, you know, in this divided age, um, when everything is so polarized, that friendship is also part of her legacy and something that we should remember, particularly at this unique moment in our history when there is so much tension and divide. I mean, we can be friends with those on the other side and respect them and not bite our tongues, but actually explain our reasons. And that's what they did for one another. Um, and, you know, that's part of it, too. The other, the other thing I'd say is, you know, I, I speak for a living, but if, I would be terrified to have to give the eulogy that uh, Rabbi Holtzman, uh, Rabbi Holtzblatt had to give today. I mean, it was like, I mean, to capture her life in so few uh, minutes, and yet she did. The rabbi was just incredible and magnificent in all the facets from how she changed the law to her family uh, and, um, uh, and, and her spirit and, and her legacy. Um, it was really beautiful and, and rose to the occasion. As we watch as members of Congress and other dignitaries uh, pause before the casket and pay their respects, I, I turn to you, Erin, because outside the court for the last two days, Justice Ginsburg's casket lay in repose and there was an outpouring there, people waiting hours to pay their own respects. I know you were there and spoke to some of the people. What kinds of things were you hearing? You know, my co-author and I drove down just for the day because we wanted to both pay our respects and spend time with the other folks who came to do the same. And it was very moving. You know, we don't get a lot of collective experiences now, especially with the pandemic. Um, there were hundreds of people just arrayed across First Street. Uh, they were shocking. Thank you, RBG. They were leaving notes and flowers. The line uh, spanned seven blocks. Just chatting with folks about what they were doing there, we met people who had flown in from Los Angeles, from Salt Lake City. There were many mother-daughter pairs. Uh, there were there were people who were crying. They were dressed up as Justice Ginsburg. They were wearing T-shirts that had quotes from her comments and her dissents. Um, they they really lined up to pay their respects and to thank a woman who opened doors for so many. And honestly, it was it made us feel really moved to be there to watch that happen. Well, we will continue to keep our eyes on this unfolding ceremony as people pay their respects. I briefly, before we go, want to go to our White House correspondent, Peter Alexander, because tomorrow, of course, Peter, the president has said that he will name her replacement. He has said it will be a woman that will take her seat on the bench. Yeah, and uh, that's exactly right, Savannah. Uh, Savannah, from the poignant to the political tomorrow at 5 p.m. in the Rose Garden, the president says he'll be making that announcement, naming a woman. Right now, all indications appear to suggest that it will be Judge Amy Coney Barrett, um, a former law clerk of Antonin Scalia. Savannah. All right, Peter Alexander, thank you to all our correspondents and analysts. Thank you. We'll have much more on MSNBC, also streaming on NBC News now. But for most of you, you'll return now to the Today Show. I'm Savannah Guthrie. This has been an NBC News special report.
started the rotation yet, so we can wait just a few more minutes and we'll start the Okay, hey everybody, let's go dark, please. You're dark. Oh, good. Go You're dark. Perfect. Okay, great. Mark, we're ready. You good, sir? You, you yeah, all good. good. All good. All good.
All right, perfect, thank you.